Good afternoon, everybody, friends, colleagues. Uh, I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It's really my pleasure today to um, participate in the celebration of uh, publication of Transnational Advocacy Networks um, and to um, participate in this conversation about the issues surrounding uh, that the, the surrounding this volume, the issues that this volume covers. In the, in the um, preface to the edition, I'm thanked, I guess, on behalf of the Watson Institute. And I, um, I want to take issue with that thanks, <laughs> because really the thanks it, it needs to go the other way, my thanking you all. And I particularly want to thank Cesar and Davis Dicia. Um, let me say the, the two main reasons why I want to thank you. First, really three reasons. First, Davis Dicia is a model for Watson. And for a lot of us at Brown, the ability and your ability, Cesar, to combine um, first-rate, cutting-edge scholarship, pure scholarship, with action and advocacy and practice is rare, um, it's exceptional, and it, it's, um, it's awesome in the, in the true sense of the word awesome. Many of us aspire to, to this model, and we're learning from you and learning from De Justicia. Um, been learning over five years and we'll continue to learn as long as I'm here. I hope we, we do. And that gets to the second point, which is about learning and collaboration. This collaboration, um, which I had nothing to do with starting, but have been a huge beneficiary of this collaboration between Watson and De Justicia, um, it is a model for us for how we aspire to partner in the future. It's a model um, of equality. It's a model, not because it's north, south, north, north, south. It's not even so much about that. It's, it's about the quality. It's about different kinds of organizations finding ways to come together. And it's really about learning in multi-directional ways. And it's my hope that um, we are going to expand this uh, cooperation and deepen it um, and certainly sustain it for, for as, long as, as long as I'm around, certainly. Um, and that really gets to my third and last point. We were talking about this just a few minutes ago, but in, in some ways, I'm sorry about how urgent this volume is. When I say I'm sorry, the five years ago, had you asked me to predict what the state of the world would be today, I couldn't have come close to describing what the world looks like and what, what the world looks like in the global south and what the world looks like in the global north. Um, I will say, unfortunately, circumstances are such that the topic of transnational advocacy networks and their role in protecting basic rights, human rights of all kinds, that topic has become incredibly urgent right here in this country and in many other locales. At the same time that the trans transnational advocacy networks themselves are under threat and are being attacked by states and others in ways that I, I could never have predicted and in places I would never have predicted, including right here in the United States. So while I said unfortunately a couple of times, that's not the, the tone I want to set. The tone I want to set is one of thanks. Thanks for producing such an urgently needed volume. Thanks for educating us. Thanks for showing us how practice and scholarship can be combined. And thanks for really um, uh, setting a model for a kind of partnership, a global partnership that we want to sustain and duplicate in a lot of ways. Sorry for going on so long. Let me turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here celebrating uh, five years of collaboration. And uh, I'd like to thank Ed and the, and, uh, the whole Watson as an institution for having made that collaboration possible and having supported it in every possible way. It's also a special pleasure to have Cesar with us today. He had to uh, successfully exercise all of his formidable skills as a transnational networker in order to be here in person from Colombia. Uh, and if he had not succeeded in doing it, it would have been a rather bittersweet event. But fortunately, he succeeded. So this is a very special volume. 
and I'm not going to uh, talk in, in great detail about the volume, but I will uh, try to hit some of the highlights. We are also celebrating today uh, what is really the third volume in this series of three volumes that have come out of the De Justicia Watson collaboration. And this is the volume called Rising to the Populist Challenge. And I will let uh, uh, Cesar say a little bit more uh, about that volume. So in any case, this, this volume brought together a group of 10 engaged researchers and reflective activists from four continents to reflect on the 20 years of evolution of transnational advocacy networks since the publication of what was a path-breaking foundational book uh, called Activists Beyond Borders, whose uh, author, Catherine Sickick, will be here as soon as she manages to uh, uh, surmount the obstacles of Amtrak, uh, which while not as formidable as the uh, um, uh, U.S. immigration system, is still an obstacle, obstacle to be uh, surmounted. In any case, the resulting 10 chapters in this volume are not just insightful and provocative, but also marvelously concrete, grounded in the specific instance, instances and experiences of the very diverse set of authors. So I'm not going to try to summarize these different uh, uh, individual studies here. Instead, I'd just like to underline three questions that, for me, are central to the project as a whole. And we'll run through those quickly, just to start out. The first is, what's changed over 20 years? The second is, why do we emphasize the concept of ecosystem, which is emphasized throughout the volume? And the third, of course, is the obvious, what are the prospects for the future? Okay, so let's, let's start with the, uh, the first one, what's happened in the course of the last 20 years. I think that it's fair to say that if we look back at the uh, turn of the 21st century, there was something that I have called millennial euphoria. That is to say there was a sense of expansiveness and unlimited possibility with regard to transnational advocacy. This sense of euphoria and unlimited possibility was not simply a, uh, an illusory um, kind of hope. It was based on the fact that during the late 20th century, the growth of transnational social movements and transnational advocacy organizations had been uh, almost explosive. Now, of course, transnational activism has been around a long time. Uh, in, uh, in Sicking's book, she starts out uh, with the 19th century movement for the abolition of slavery. But the late 20th century was really a new era for TANS. They burst onto the global scene both conceptually and in fact. They, the number of transnational social movement organizations doubled uh, between 1973 and 1983 and then doubled again between 1983 and 1993. So, that meant that people looking at transnational advocacy networks really felt here is a new actor on the global scene, one that will be increasingly important and increasingly influential in determining the course of events not only globally, but within national boundaries. Now, it's not just that there was explosive growth in the late 20th century. It, there was also, it was also the case that there was institutional construction that was quite formidable. Groups like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. I mean, Amnesty became a one million strong global presence. Human Rights Watch became a global presence. Those organizations consolidated and 
burgeoned as actors. Perhaps even more important, during the initial decades of the 21st century, there was a shifting structure of transnational organizations that reduced the geographic asymmetries, reduced the dominance of a few global north organizations like Amnesty and, and Human Rights Watch, increased the diversity not only of organizations geographically, but also of the themes that organizations were involved in. Human rights expanded to become economic, social, and cultural rights as well. And there was, together with this increased diversity, also increased possibilities for collaboration that we'll talk about a little more when we get back to that concept of the ecosystem. Now, of course, recently, in the last, I would say, five years, there have been new challenges. There have been challenges generated by, as Ed said, the rise of reactionary nationalist populist regimes, creating harsh challenges, not just to transnational uh, activist networks, but to all organizations and social movements working to uh, enhance the dignified li uh, livelihoods of ordinary people and to expand the voice of these people in the decisions that affect their lives. So, this new shift, that is the shift to the rise of nationalist, reactionary, populist, national regimes, obviously creates a whole new set of challenges to uh, transnational activist networks and really sort of defines our uh, contemporary period. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to the what's next for the future part. But the important thing to, to, uh, to underline here is that if we look over the last 20 years, we've seen a trajectory first of dramatic expansion, consolidation and institutionalization, and now challenges that test resilience. Okay, so, oops, there we go. So why do we use the term ecosystem? Well, we use the term ecosystem because we feel that both as an analytical frame and as a way of thinking about the system from the point of view of people involved in being activists, that the notion of ecosystem is a very important one. Now, why, why does ecosystem work? Well, a robust, vibrant ecosystem depends on what? It depends, first of all, on diversity and differentiation among different parts of the system, but it also depends upon the ability of those differentiated, different kinds of diversified actors and parts of the system being able, being able to interact in ways that enhance each other's efficacy and enhance each other's possibilities for realizing individual goals. So we are trying to emphasize by talking about the ecosystem of transnational advocacy, we are trying to emphasize first the diversity and multiplicity of organizations and movements that, that constitute it, and second, the importance of synergistic collaboration instead of internecine competition among those organizations. And this is uh, a recurring th theme throughout the volume, and there's some great individual examples of, uh, of how this works in a positive way. There are also some examples of how you do end up with internecine competition that is counterproductive. But the important thing is that we feel that you need to think about this system as an ecosystem rather than simply as an aggregation or collection of individual transnational advocacy or organizations focused on individual substantive issues using uh, specific kinds of organizational forms and strategies. Okay. Now, 
this ecosystem, which has developed um, over the course of the 20-year uh, period, is now, as I said to begin with, facing a serious set of threats and challenges. These reactionary nationalist populist regimes that have emerged are not just virulent in terms of their impact on rights, livelihoods, and democratic uh, possibilities of voice. They are also astutely able to exploit the political frames in which they operate and are therefore very dangerous. They are very good at portraying transnational advocacy networks as alien threats to local culture and values and priorities. They are very good at turning the transnational advocate into the other, the dangerous other, as opposed to acknowledging the ways in which transnational advocacy networks are both grounded in and in turn support local movements and organizations aimed at improving dignified livelihoods, sustainable citizenship, and democratic voice. Now, at the same time, I think it's important to realize that the environment, even though the dramatic shift has been the rise of these reactionary nationalist populist regimes, the environment still contains the kinds of positive elements that were central to the growth of transnational advocacy networks and continue to be central to their sustenance. That is to say, the normative understandings on which TANs are grounded are still in place. The old days when you could, uh, when a national regime was able to say, whatever I do to my people within my geographic territory, that's my business and is part of sovereignty. Those days, while these regimes may be trying to recapture them, those days as a dominant global norm are gone. And therefore, they, these nationalist populist regimes are fighting against a different normative environment than they were 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. It's also the case that new possibilities for communication, new possibilities for collaboration have changed on the basis of a technological evolution that is not going to be reversed. And so those possibilities for communication and collaboration are still there. And finally, the institutional and organizational forms that were constructed during the consolidation of TANs are still there. They don't disappear. They are robust and durable. They may be defeated in particular instances, but they will not disappear. And so therefore, we would argue that the current ecosystem is more robust and resilient overall than it was 20 years ago. So that leaves us to the question of where do we go from here? And with that question, I will turn the floor over to my colleague Cesar, who thinks about it every day, all day, and will now share some of his ideas with you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted to begin by thanking uh, the Watson Institute, Ed, also Rick Lock, who was here when we first started this collaboration, and of course Peter and um, and Patrick both uh, personally on behalf of the Justicia for this partnership. Anything that lasts for five years, at least in my corner of the world, is a feat. Uh, and uh, and anything and 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 these unlikely collaborations 
in academia and in, in human rights activism and social justice activism uh, may be fleeting, right? Because there are all kinds of incentives that militate against doing exactly what we're trying to do, which is for those of you who go to school here, um, is trying to combine quality, quality research with on the ground advocacy. And uh, one of the things that's been most encouraging about this collaboration is that it's not only led to the publication of volumes, but to the training of students. So there's a, there's a steady stream of brown students going to the Justicia, starting with the ones that uh, uh, took my class when I was a visiting professor here four or five years ago. And then they have been very diligent in telling others, and we have uh, someone here who spent some time with us, um, telling their friends that there's an interesting space there in Bogota uh, of an organization uh, called the Justicia doing action research uh, on international issues but also of course on Colombia so that's one of the beauties of, of this collaboration now one of the things that action research tries to do and I wrote a, a piece called uh, amphibious research that tries to argue for this type of hybrid Right, a hybrid between um, systematic academic work and directly relevant advocacy practice. Um, and just like frogs feel comfortable transitioning from water to uh, land, uh, the idea is for students and hopefully also faculty to feel comfortable in that transition and to create spaces and, and nurture spaces uh, like Watson or the Justicia <coughs> that legitimate and facilitate this type of hybrid work. Now, one of the aspirations of action research is to be timely and relevant. But as said, as Ed said, we wish that this time around we had not been as timely and relevant because this is what we got now. Right? This, uh, when we first started this collaboration, only, I don't know, maybe it was Orban who's been at it for longer, um, but I guess a Putin, maybe those were the two pieces in this puzzle. But everyone else has come in between the different books that we've published. It's not any. It's not our responsibility. Uh, the, this collaboration has nothing to do with the rise of authoritarian populism around the world. But it just so happens that it's happened while we were working on these issues. And that's and this is why. And I guess, uh, and I know that Peter wanted me to talk about this other book when he said that. I would address the future. This book actually was the third in the De Justicia Watson series. It's entitled Rising to the Populist Challenge, a new playbook, playbook for human rights actors. This was the third conference that we put together, but the volume came out before the TANS, uh, Transitional Advocate Neighbors uh, uh, volume, precisely because we thought it would be particularly relevant and timely. For the for this moment of uncertainty, and I spent part of my time in human rights practice, and um, and there is this sense of both urgency and transition or even crisis, right? Uh, of course, uh, the rise of uh, movements and uh, leaders, uh, presidents and leaders that um, very directly embrace anti-rights uh, discourse and values and norms is very concerning for everyone in the human rights movement and also in in the in academic quarters that work for social justice and, 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 and social inclusion. So the question is, well, what's happened and what to do about it? And this is what this book tries to do. The first uh, chapter is an effort at diagnosing what these and other movements and leaders have in common, right? Why is it that uh, movements and political parties from very different ideolo ideological quarters, right? So we have Maduro there, uh, and the Justicia. Uh, we have worked very closely with the uh, Venezuelan human rights organizations that have been going through the most difficult times. Venezuela is the most urgent, the biggest humanitarian. It doesn't get enough attention, but it is the most pressing humanitarian emergency in Latin America. Literally hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of migrants crossing over the border uh, to Colombia and going, working because they have, they have no resources even to buy a bus ticket, 
uh, walking down Colombian roads, uh, trying to get either to Colombian cities or continue down to Peru, uh, Venezuela, Brazil, and, and other places. And in working uh, with them, of course, there is this, uh, uh, when we discuss uh, the, the urgencies of the moment, uh, many of them come from a tradition of the left in Latin America, which has been associated with human rights activists. But it is a supposedly leftist government that's making their life miserable and almost impossible, right? And Maduro is implementing measures against a human rights NGO that look very similar to those that other uh, leaders on the right of the political spectrum here. So here's Viktor Orban, the president of, of uh, Hungary, small country, but one that's probably the pioneer in the dismantling of uh, democratic uh, rules uh, in this wave of authoritarian populism. Um, we did that exercise. That's part of the opening chapter. We didn't publish the whole the whole chart, but uh, with Chris Nagomis, uh, uh, the co-editor of this volume, and and some de justicia researchers, including uh, uh, Brown alumni uh, Camila Bustos, we looked at all the laws that these governments have put in place to close or reduce spaces for civil society mobilization. And what we found is that they look very much alike. So the foreign agent law uh, that Putin put in place to brand human rights activists and organizations as foreign agents, traders of the, of the motherland and so on, and that made it very hard, actually impossible for those NGOs and organizations to receive any philanthropic funding from uh, from other countries, but that's exactly what's been done in Egypt, what drove some uh, large philanthropic foundations from India. Uh, so this really cuts across this uh, uh, the left-right ideological uh, divide. So and and that means that there is active learning among these movements and 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 um, and governments. And this is why we call their uh, standard approach to. Uh, closing civil society spaces, a playbook, <coughs> right? So unfortunately, and this is what you get uh, when you, what you can achieve when you do systematic research, that's the academic component of this hybrid, uh, we can sadly forecast some of the measures that Bolsonaro will take in, in Brazil. I can tell you what he'll do within the next 100 days. He will, among many other things, uh, so he will uh, try to um, make it hard for, for uh, NGOs to receive those uh, uh, foreign funds. It will make it harder to, for organizations in Brazil to register legally as NGOs, as nonprofits. It will very likely uh, withdraw state advertisement from independent media, from media outlets that depend heavily on that source of revenue to try to control the media. Uh, and uh, he will do things, he will try to do things like what Orban did, which is to chip away at the uh, institutions that might be, by proof, too independent uh, for his government to take over uh, the state, Ministerio Publico, the Supreme Court. Uh, so this playbook has been quite effective at undermining, or some people would say hacking, uh, the basic rules and norms of democratic governance, and that's a very worrying development. I don't want to. I don't mean to get you even more worried about this because we're worried enough. Uh, but uh, but this is an effort and understanding the connections among this uh, seemingly disparate dots in the in the political landscape. Um, and of course, one of the um, connotations and characteristics of this way that make it very hard for human rights organizations to push back against is the fact that this, most of these threats are coming from democratically elected governments. So this is what Provea, the great Venezuelan human rights thing do tank has called dictatorships of the 21st century. So if they were uh, dictators and dictatorships of the usual kind, right, of the, of the 20th century, here's Catherine, uh, um, of the 20th century, well, the 20th century, um, democratic governance used to be undermined through uh, 
spectacular moves like a military coup, right? And, and then human rights activists will be able to uh, denounce uh, those governments as being illegitimate on grounds of not having respected the basic rules of democratic, even, even, the, 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 uh, even the, the, the um, access to power through democratic means. However, as Provea calls them, 21st century democracies, um, uh, dictatorships or 21st century dictators get to power through uh, democratic means and then tinker with the rules of democratic governance uh, slowly uh, but surely to the point that they rig the system and um, make it very hard for anyone from the opposition to uh, win any election. So that's what happened in, in Hungary. Catherine and I have been teaching together. Uh, I just remember that you recruited me for that uh, course and that program here at Brown. So we met here at Brown. So Brown has all kinds of interesting uh, side effects. Uh, so, um, so we've been teaching in, in Hungary for five years now, uh, every summer. And this year uh, was the last one in Budapest because uh, the CEU, the Central European University, will need to move elsewhere. So that course will be, have to be taught in Berlin as opposed to Hungary. And this overlaps partially both with the uh, with the duration of our collaboration, and uh, I don't know if <laughs> now I'm getting worried that everything has to do with <laughs> what we're doing. Uh, so Orban, over the course of five years, has continued to undermine piece by piece, to dismantle piece, piece by piece, uh, the basic institutions of democratic governance. And, and the turning point came uh, in the 19, the initial pieces came in the 19, uh, late, uh, in the early 2000s, when the, his movement um, took over one of the most independent judiciaries in Central Europe, that was actually the Constitutional Court of Hungary, it was a model for, for the rest of, of uh, um, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. He co-opted the courts, and then he continued on from there. Uh, this is why the signs of, of, uh, of the tinkering with the rules of the electoral game here in the U.S. are so concerning, right? What's happening in Florida, what's going in, in going on in, in Georgia is exactly what's happening in other places. Uh, and this is why some people talk about the uh, Latin Americanization of, of the US. Um, we, so this is, this is what we have in this book in terms of diagnosis of uh, demo, uh, authoritarian populism. There's more, but I, would, I don't have time to go into more details. But I will say something in closing about the future and the responses. Because most of the book is about how human rights organizations and actors have responded to these formidable challenges. And we have chapters by colleagues from Hungary, uh, from India, um, from, um, uh, we had a, a one on South Africa, I'm going through the list here. We have uh, a couple of, of colleagues writing about uh, Turkey. Uh, and. We also have a chapter on Venezuela, and we have a number of chapters that try to connect those dots, including Catherine's uh, uh, chapter contesting the idea that this is a global trend, and trying to put this in perspective and trying to figure out what's new and what's business as usual in the attacks against human rights organizations. Um, let me finish with a, a couple of ideas. Some of those are already in the book, and some others have emerged in the context of, of having discussed this book with many human rights organizations in different parts of the world. And so one encouraging uh, sign about a discouraging trend is that people have found this, this uh, volume relevant in thinking about these challenges. And, and one of the things that I've come to conclude in those conversations is that there, there, there's a, this greater need for longer term thinking about the challenges of human rights. Because many of these developments will probably not go away uh, very soon. These trends are here to stay. Uh, Yasha Monk, a uh, uh, German researcher, uh, spends time at Harvard. He wrote this piece after the Bolsonaro victory, and he said, look, this is probably not the cusp of the, of the wave, of the, of, of the uh, ascent of um, authoritarian populism. Uh, because some of the underlying trends, like technological disruption, 
of the fact that we're siloed into echo chambers and that uh, uh, social media get uh, uh, get us to uh, get the worst of us out of uh, uh, get, uh, get us to behave in our worst possible personas. Uh, that all of that is probably here to stay, unless there's radical um, reimagination of the business model of the relation of social media. Uh, and likewise, uh, there are systemic challenges, uh, systemic. Um, um, issues uh, and global issues like climate change that we now know um, are even more urgent than we had anticipated. Uh, so because of all of that, one of the things that I, I, I believe um, can be learned from uh, these collaborations and this book in particular is the need for thinking uh, more systematically about what those longer term, uh, longer, longer term trends mean for human rights advocacy. Uh, and finally, and I'll end with this because one of the things that we all share here, I guess, in this, at least in this table and in the, um, in the larger collaboration between Brown and the Justicia, is what Albert Hirschman uh, called a bias for hope. And Catherine published a fantastic book entitled uh, Evidence for Hope. So it's not, and this is not to be uh, Pollyannish, and this is not just to uh, cheer you up. Uh, but there are reasons and, uh, to believe that um, uh, human rights actors, in combination with other movements, with other transnational advocacy networks, are already developing seeds of responses uh, that hold out the prospect <coughs> for a more effective, impactful form of advocacy. And some of those, um, um, and illustrations of some of those forms of renewal in human rights strategies are illustrated in this book and also in the newer book that we just published. So uh, we invite you all to take a look at both volumes. They're all available uh, for free on both websites. We believe in creating commons and, and the free flow of information and knowledge. So um, uh, they're out there for practitioners, students, and academics uh, to take advantage of. Thank you. So, so you have been speaking now for about 50 minutes, is that right? Started at 4.30? It started at least, and it started about quarter to five. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for last time. Hi, Peter. Hi, <laughs> Patrick. Hi, Cesar. Good to see you all. Hello, brown folks. Um, and I'm sorry I'm late. Let me explain to you. I, I taught a class at the Harvard Kennedy School caught the train and was slightly delayed, but I made it here on time. And I, I wanted to come, even though I had to come late, because my collaborations over the years with colleagues here, and with Cesar and with colleagues here at Brown, uh, have been so important to me. So much so, and can I tell this story? If it weren't for Peter Evans, I might not have started working on human rights. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is, uh, of course, I. When I was your, the age of some of the students here, I worked at an uh, NGO in Washington called the Washington Office on Latin America. I decided I was kind of cut, I wasn't cut out to be an activist, actually. I, I, I loved the cause, I, be, I believed in the people, and I didn't want to go to work on Monday. Um, and what I realized was I, li I was more inclined to research. I liked research more than activism, but I, I believed in the importance of activism. I just wasn't good at it. So, um, uh, and so I did my dissertation on some other topic, and I was working on other topics, and Peter gave me a call, and he asked me to be part of a volume uh, double, that became double H diplomacy. And he said, we want you to work on human rights in Argentina. And I said, Peter, I don't think you know this, but I actually know a lot about that topic. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, I did my first ever chapter on human rights, and that was published in 93, and I haven't stopped doing it ever since. So I, I'm sure I've said this to you before, but I'm, I'm still grateful to Peter for having turned me to a research area that's been so fruitful for me. Um, and so today, this, I, this, I saw this book just as I walked in the door. I hadn't seen it before, so I, I'm very happy to see it. And I'm particularly happy because it really um, makes me reflect on a book that I wrote 
over 20 years ago now, 20 years ago now, 20 years ago with a colleague, Margaret Keck, Mimi Keck, um, called Activists Beyond Borders, uh, and you may have mentioned it earlier. Um, and we wrote that book because both of us had been working, had had lives working in the human rights movement, what I'd done in Washington before I went to graduate school, and what Mimi had worked on the environmental movement uh, a lot in Brazil. And then we went to graduate school in, you know, the early 80s, so ages ago, and we discovered that the work, the lives we had lived in activism were not at all reflected in the academic literature of the time. And so we wrote Activists Beyond Borders. It's hard to think that now, because now we're awash with literature on transnational <laughs> activism. And so you see it everywhere, and, and it, it may even be kind of stale and old-fashioned nowadays. But back then, really, there wasn't very much written on it. And so we wrote it trying to make a point to political scientists and sociologists and others that these were important issues to study. Okay? Then, in the meantime, the field has transformed dramatically. We asked four main <coughs> questions. We asked, what are transnational advocacy networks? Why do they emerge? How do they work? And number four, under what conditions can they be effective? And I think our book provoked a big uh, reaction. And part of it was pushback, part of it was critique. Um, and, and a lot of that was more focused on questions one, two, and three. Um, and in particular, there was a huge debate about whether or not these activist groups were indeed principled. Right? We had said at one point, these are principled groups. I actually said at another point in the book, they were principled and strategic. But people just focused on the fact that they were principled. And so there was a big fight. Were they really principled? They did other things. They raised money. Um, and so, but I felt like not enough attention was directed to it. For me, it was the most important question. That is, under what conditions can transnational advocacy networks be effective? Um, and we developed a definition of what we meant by effectiveness. Uh, that definition took into a, you know, had five levels, right? And the fifth level was we get behavioral change by states or other target actors like transnational corporations. But we realized that, you know, that's what we all want eventually, but we can't measure effectiveness only when you get behavioral change because activists are doing other things. They're literally creating issues. They're making us aware of new issues. Something like LGBT I, rights would be a good example. It wasn't on the agenda. <coughs> Activists put it on the agenda. And just getting that issue on the agenda in itself is a measure of effectiveness. Okay? But ultimately, you know, that's great. We want to give credit for effectiveness to get an issue on the agenda. But if you start not getting behavioral change, ultimately you want to say what's wrong with that. <coughs> um, and so uh, so I feel like if we look to the future, I'm going to look to the future both in terms of research, but also in terms of just activism, that n more needs to be done for understanding under what conditions can advocacy networks be effective. And one reason for that, of course, is when I started around advocacy networks, they were mainly a phenomena of the left, right? Of mainly progressive groups who were organizing transnationally. Since that time, as they sort of pointed out, advocacy networks have become uh, used also by groups of the center and also by the right. right? And so it becomes, um, right now, when we're thinking what's going on in our world, one of the things we know is that we've had this dictator's uh, learning curve, okay? That governments, dictators have learned, uh, and the electoral authoritarians have learned how to respond to these advocacy networks, and groups of the right have learned how to use the same tools to organize transnationally and to organize domestically. Um, and so th under understanding well, what, under what conditions can, can advocacy networks be effective is, is really important. And one, it, one hypothesis we actually had in the book and it's the, is that the, the issues themselves mattered, right? That, the, that there were <coughs> issues that when we looked historically and in the current period at the advocacy networks that appeared to be most effective, we saw they were characterized by a handful of issues. Those issues we said at the time, we said it looks to us like issues involving bodily harm to vulnerable 
or perceived innocent groups, and uh, issues involving equality of opportunity were areas where we saw some of the biggest change. So we looked at suffrage movements, we looked at anti-slavery, we looked at anti-apartheid. Those were all movements for equality of opportunity. Right? But we'd also look at the human rights movements uh, in the 70s that were really organized around disappearance, <coughs> torture, political <coughs> imprisonment. And so, so we wondered whether there was something about certain issues that made them more amenable to, uh, more, to be more effective. That piece of the book we've never, uh, no, I, that, lit that never carried through on. And I think it's all the more important today. It's all the more important in the context of the kind of, um, you know, these right-wing populists that, that, uh, that Cesar was talking about. Because we can see that there are, that the set of issues that are mobilizing people are broader than that. And we don't understand yet very well how issues that the populists, the right-wing populists, are using. We don't understand them why they're effective, but we, we see that they are effective, right? We see they're effectively mobilizing. And they're mobilizing around other kinds of issues. Uh, they're mobilizing on issues of, you know, we versus they, you know, sort of uh, the creating of uh, the, the other, uh, often the immigrant other, but not only the immigrant other. Um, they're organized around issues, and that's kind of issues of nationalism, of course, which is always we versus they. Uh, they're organized around uh, uh, issues that have to do with kind of authority uh, and, and obeying kind of traditional authority. And so I, I would like to suggest that we have a lot more to do to understand what are the kinds of issues that really are mobilizing people. And we need to understand it, not just what works for left left-wing groups, we need to know why, why things are working for some of these right-wing groups as well. Okay, but what my chapter in this book was about um, is, a, is a second issue. When, when, when you try to measure effectiveness, you have, to ha you have to be able to know what you mean by effectiveness and know how you would measure it. And in the book, we suggest, in the book 20 years ago, we suggested kind of in passing, buried in chapter 5, that there might be something called an information paradox. That, that social movements themselves, by creating new issues, and by really uh, uh, publishing more reports, and really getting on, on the agenda, might be inadvertently sometimes giving the impression the situation was getting worse. Okay? And we use a whole, there was a whole chapter on violence against women, where we made this example. Women's <coughs> groups around the world had united transnationally to literally create the issue of violence against women. I mean, right now we go, of course there was an issue of violence against women. But at the time, it was not a global issue. There were a series of national campaigns about dowry death in India, about domestic abuse in the United States, about rape of political prisoners in Latin America. And they were united as a global campaign around something that was named violence against women. Okay? Um, and for the first time, people started gathering data on violence against women. Because people were, people were not gathering data. To, to date, still today, we don't have good data, comparative data on rape in the world, for example. And we only started getting good rape data because women organized against rape and demanded data. So what happens then, though, when you first start demanding data is, uh, and you have more and more groups doing more reports, your data starts getting better over time. And when data gets bad over time, it may start looking like the problem is getting worse. And this has been the case with rape data, for example. Uh, there's a perception today that we have an epidemic of rape in wartime in the world. And the truth is we don't know if we have an epidemic of rape because we didn't collect data on it before. And now we're starting to collect data. And we may have an epidemic or we may, we may, have, we may have, you know, uh, good data on it. And so I started getting concerned, and this is the topic of my chapter in the book, about um, this information paradox, or what I called information effects. And that is that inadvertently, activists could be creating more and more information about a wider variety of human rights violations <coughs> and providing evidence to their critics that 
the world was actually getting worse. In other words, that the critics of human rights are using the data produced by activists themselves in order to say, you are not making an effect. And I want to just give you an example, uh, to, because it seems a little counterintuitive. So Eric Posner, who's one of the uh, legal scholars of the University of Chicago, who wrote a book called The Twilight of Human Rights Law. And he basically said, human rights, there's been no improvement in human rights since 19, uh, basically since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Uh, and he goes, let's, the, there's no marked decrease in human rights violations. Let's face the fact human rights law doesn't work, and let's move on. And the first example he gives in that book is an example that will be familiar to, to Peter and those of you who work on Brazil. Um, he said, for example, today, in the favelas of Brazil, the, they, the police go to the favelas, and more and more, uh, uh, especially black young men, are being killed. And he said, this, if we look at extrajudicial executions in Brazil, there are more extrajudicial executions today than there were in the past. He was using data from a group called the Observatorio uh, in, uh, in Sao Paulo that was a new group formed in Brazil that started to, tra started to for the first time ever, uh, document killing in the favelas. But he was making a, a, a comparison. He was using a database that had started to be only about extrajudicial executions when the government killed its political opponents. Okay? It didn't include going into favelas and killing uh, young men. It included the government, under the military dictatorship, killing its political opponents. Okay. And so the good news was that the human rights activists in Brazil were able to get, say, oh no, we have other kinds of extrajudicial executions in this country, ones that we've never counted before, we've never talked about them before. And that's when the police go into favelas. Okay. And so we started seeing in the, in, in, an increase in extrajudicial executions in Brazil. It wasn't at all clear that this was because under the democratic Brazil there were more extrajudicial executions or whether there was more knowledge, there was more knowledge about this new form of extrajudicial execution and we were finally counting it. Right. So it's a, it's a dilemma we face in this field. It turns out it's not only a dilemma we face in this field, it's a dilemma they face in other fields as well. And you may have heard about you know, people trying to count autism in uh, the public health field. You know, we actually don't know whether there's more autism in the world or whether we're counting, we are diagnosing more autism or, whether, or both. Maybe there's more autism and more diagnosed with autism. Right? Public health people call this issue surveillance bias. The issue is the closer you look, the more you find. And they know that if you're doing a double-blind study of uh, a double-blind uh, study where you, you have your control group, if you put the control group under an MRI machine, they get sick more often. What does that mean? You know, they're, obviously they're not getting sick because they're going to the MRI machine. The MRI machine finds illness. It finds illness. It's because you're looking closer, you find more illness, right? So that, these public health people doing these double-blind studies know they have to control for what they call surveillance or detection bias. We in the human rights field, and for that matter I would say in the transnational advocacy field, actually have surveillance bias. <coughs> but we don't know it. We don't know it. We don't, we don't control for it. We don't, we don't try to figure out how that could affect our perceptions of effectiveness. Um, and not only that, we're a little worried to even talk about it this way, because we're worried that we're, activists, I believe, need as part of the power of their message to say that things are getting worse. Okay, how are you going to get people to follow you and believe you and organize with you if you say, actually, been working hard and things are getting better, but there's still problems. Okay, so. They, so activists fear they say things are getting better that there'll be complacency and maybe indifference. On the other hand, if you keep saying things are getting worse, we've been working 50 years on human rights, 70 years in your declaration, and things are getting worse, then maybe Eric Posner is right. Maybe human rights don't work and we should give up. So we're kind of caught in this bind, right, of how to recognize progress and say we've been effective, 
or you know, just from a social science point of view, how to, how to measure progress in a serious social science way. Um, and at the same time, keep making sure we're not making people complacent. And so I just want to, you know, you can read my chapter for the details, but I want to just end, and this is an issue that I'm dealing with in my book, Evidence for Hope. The reason I put the word hope in the title of the book in what many people think are these dark times uh, is because uh, um, you know, I, I draw on this social change uh, organizer, Saul Alinsky. Alinsky said that to bring about social change, you need three things. You need anger, you need hope, and you need the belief you can make a difference. Right? And so anger is important but for, for bringing out social change, but it burns out quickly. Someone just said that they said, anger is like the, the, the spark plugs in your car, okay? But hope is the gasoline. So what keeps you going over the long term is you have to also have hope. Um, and then finally, you have to believe you can make a difference. And not only that you can make a difference, you have to know how you can make a difference. And so unless we do the kind of research to be able to really explore things that have really worked in the past, we won't know how to uh, sustain change into the future. <clears throat> um, so on that note, let me end, and we'll have time for discussion, I hope. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like, if I, I'll, I'll try to start the discussion. I'll be really brief. I just have four questions. For, for the three of you. Um, one, do institutions matter? I, you know, this literature, social movements, transnational activist networks, it's always about contention, it's always about problematizing the unproblematized, et cetera. And one of the criticisms of the social movement literature is it doesn't pay a lot of attention to institutionalization. And yet, especially thinking about Latin America, over the last 30 years, if there's one huge, massive, significant effect that movements have had, it's been institutions. And in light of the reversals we're seeing, et cetera, how much do institutions matter? A second question, um, and this was already raised in, in Activists Beyond Borders, this is essentially, a, the TANS argument is an argument about the articulation between this global human rights field and local civil societies. And it strikes me that that's an important articulation, but that there's tremendous variation. Uh, Latin America is, is maybe the more synergistic case, and most recently we have Tiana Pichel's book on making black political subjects, which really shows that articulation. But there's a piece by Harsh Mundar in um, one of these volumes, I'm losing track of all these volumes, but Rising of the Populist Challenge. And Harsh, you know, Harsh Mandar is a well-known Indian activist who's been a key player in every piece of, of rights-based legislation in the last two decades. He basically says the international human rights regime doesn't matter in India, you know, and in part because they have democratic spaces themselves, they don't need the boomerang, and yet I think it has mattered, but in ways that are maybe different, and maybe we could think about that a bit. I, I want to ask the, the you know, the $100 million question, which is across different sectors, uh, where in the millennial euphoria that Peter talked about, which of those, in, in which sectors did TAMs get the most traction? So there's a huge difference between a violence against women and say labor and environmentalism somewhere in between there, and I know you all have a lot to say about that, but just to get some sense of what you think the variation looks like. And then the fourth big question, to to, to build on Catherine's point, I, I, I agree that you know the most important thing movements do is problematize the unproblematized. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the question is, what's the next thing that's going to be problematized? Um, and I think possibly, and this is a bias for hope, the next thing that's going to be problematized is democracy. Um, you know, here in the US, I mean, the most interesting thing about the last two years is we've actually had a conversation about democracy, about voter suppression, about the electoral college, about the lack of participation, about the importance of keeping the you know institutions separate and checks and balances, et cetera. And in India, one of the striking things, you know, Gramsci always said the fish never talk about the water, and Indians are like Americans, they never talk about democracy. They just sort of take it for granted. And yet 
India's had, a very, I think, a really interesting conversation of late about democracy. And then the most important, the most interesting case to me, and, and I just have to highlight this because it's the one big positive change uh, that we've seen since, since we had this conference. The one personality, the one charismatic, patriarchal, autocratic uh, personality that you didn't have up there was Jacob Zuma. And Jacob Zuma is gone. And he was ousted democratically, and he was ousted by civil society, um, and has been very much part of a conversation about revitalizing South African democracy after 20 years of sort of top-down ANC rule. Uh, so maybe this is the new issue that's going to be problematized by transnational advocacy networks. OK. I, I think that what we should do, we're, we, we've actually uh, we're threatening here to be running out of time. So I think, I think what we should do is to just gather, in addition to Patrick's four questions, uh, we should gather uh, three or four questions from you all and, uh, and then let, uh, uh, let folks respond to those. And then we can go out and have our reception and uh, um, think about it uh, more informally. So I, let, me, let, me, let me open up the floor to uh, questions. Questions, questions, questions. Yes. Do, do say who you are, especially since you've been partly identified previously. Yeah? Um, right before coming in, I was reading about the appointment wait, for the new foreign minister of Brazil, who's um, a guy who's saying, you know, that um, climate change is a Marxist plot. Um, that is meant to stifle Western economies. Um, and he's saying that, you know, there's a criminalization of red meat and oil and of heterosexual sex responding to, you know, movements against violence against women or movements against violence against homosexuals um, in Brazil, which are very much connected to, I think, you know, movements in the United States and elsewhere, right? It's the rise of things that have been problematized globally and partly because of social media, there's more of a conversation. Uh, and that's obviously also the case with climate change. So, and obviously his statements really echo what, you know, Trump would be saying in the United States. So it seems like the similarity between populists coming to power in different parts of the world is not only a question of tools, but a question of the issues that they're responding to, like what is the backlash against? Um, and the issues that are being raised in different parts of the world by activists are also connected. So I wonder, I don't know, how much can we connect the rise of these new popul um, democratic dictators to also uh, transnational activist movements and what they've done in the past 20 years? And okay, well, that's a small question that we can, <laughs> yeah. Anindita, the sociology department. Um, sorry? Louder, yeah. Um, so I have a question about um, where is subnational politics in all of this, which is that again between sort of the transnational and the local, you know, we've completely missed sort of how regional variations within countries and subnational political leaders actually becoming in some ways bulwarks to, you know, these, these national populist um, authoritarian, elect I like that the term electoral authoritarians. Um, so yeah, so where are the subnational political leaders, and and can they serve as some sort of a, sort of safeguard? And, um, and the second point was sort of um, this information paradox. I thought this was super interesting, and I remember this from your book. And um, I, I I wanted to just add here that there was this case of the the the, Kathwa, the ra rape case in Kashmir, where an eight-year-old girl was raped in a in a in a temple, and when Human rights activists began to publicize that, I mean, sort of make that an issue of national outrage. Um, just making that information available and sort of counting the number of rapes of, of Muslim, um, you know, women and girls actually resulted in a counter sort of um, data collection exercise of where that the same rape cases were counted with, oh, but look at how many, you know, look at the selective outrage and there aren't, you know, no one's reporting how many young Hindu girls have been raped. And, and sort of using that to almost counter this um, sort of human rights um, activists and celebrities and so on. Um, so I just wanted to add that that really resonated with what we're seeing in India today. Um, and it's not just it's not just fake news, uh, but it's being it's being used to legitimize um, 
how the right is also entering this human rights, this space of sort of human rights activism in a way. Yes, in the back. Uh, does this imply that the United Nations has failed in these efforts, or is the United Nations uh, indeed active uh, already? Okay. And in the middle back. Uh, so my question has to do sort of like the transnational advocacy, the civil, civil, civil rights groups, etc., and versus the government. So it's it's. It's interesting that we see this um, sort of international network of um, activist groups that are trying to bring about changes. And a lot of times, a lot of changes are quite deeply ingrained within the fundamental structure of the society. And we can't say, you know, use the Turkish say, uh, saying, you know, fish things with his head. So a lot of times, it could be some of the institutional basis with the government functioning, as we can see in Hungary, China, etc. But at the same time, we see this populist movement. So why do you think that is that? this sort of international civil rights group that are trying to promote the interests of the people who are victimized by many of the state policies are not gaining so much traction in some places within these people, but rather the government who in some cases are sort of exploiting the people are gaining more traction among them. So, you know, the number one case in my, coming up my head would be Hungary. They don't, Hungarian citizens in rural Hungary, they don't believe in the EU. We're actually allocating them so much funding with these kind of things, but they believe in the Hungarian government which is right now massively corrupt. Okay, I, th I think uh, that's probably enough on the table. I, I think we've got, uh, as I estimate, uh, three minutes apiece to, <laughs> to uh, deal with these questions. And uh, we'll start with Catherine, reversing the order. Okay, well, I guess each of us can only do a few. So maybe I'm going to talk about <laughs> Yeah, no, very few. Do institutions matter? Because uh, one, uh, the issue, transnational ads networks were an effort to begin with to not only be about social movements, right? Because the ads network often did link together people in institutions. Second, social movements often work very hard to create institutions. And this may go to the question about the UN. Um, so sometimes people want to sort of say there's the good human rights groups of little h, little r, those are the domestic pure groups, and there's the bad human rights institutions, <laughs> capital H, capital R, that's the UN. But if you look at the fact that, you know, how hard human rights organizations have tried over the years to create institutions, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, that Cesar has worked a lot on the American court, was very much a, you know, a desire and a effort of social movements and, and government uh, jurists and, and diplomats, and then it's been used very successfully by social movements as well. And you know, CESA has done a great case on the Sarayaku indigenous people in and, and Ecuador to show how these indigenous groups can use institutions. So at their best, and, and you know, not all institutions are their best, at their best, uh, these institutions can be uh, effectively, uh, they can be arenas for effective action of, of advocacy networks, okay? Um, so that, um, in terms of the, um, I don't know where to go. I, I, I'm just going to start with the Zuma. I'm just going to end with the Zuma issue. Um, so one of the things is actually, and I'm using three different databases that political scientists use to measure democracy. There, while well, there are a lot of big challenges to democracy in the world, uh, the number of democracies is still either equal to or quite close to the highest number we have had historically. Okay, now that's using Polity, Freedom House, and VDEM, for those of you who are thinking about it. And so what does it mean? It means we hear about all the ways democracy is challenged, and we don't hear about the, the ways where democracy is sustained or improved. And it's the nature, you know, you don't hear, we're not hearing about South Africa after Zuma, we're not hearing about Armenia, for example, we're not hearing Ecuador. about Gabon, and we're not hearing about Ecuador, Okay, because as soon as a, a topic falls off the front pages, because things are getting better, you don't hear about it. You hear about the bad things. That's a news bias. That's fine, but again, we as people trying to keep a, 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 a stock of what's happening need to consult some of these sources and realize that there's big, big challenges of democracy in the world, but there's not, there, it's, you know, democracy in their total number is still pretty close to, to an all-time high. Cesar. I'll try to address a couple of 
questions. One, uh, Oriana's question about the backlash. I I think that that's a very important question, along the, you know, very much along the lines of what uh, Catherine said uh, about um, pending issues for research uh, to study uh, right wing mo movements and transnational advocacy networks, and also to theorize and empirically document. Uh, reverse spiral. So, so this yeah. is uh, something that uh, um, you know, pioneer human rights scholars like Catherine and her collaborators uh, thought about very rigorously early on about how um, human rights norms and basically went through this process of expansion of standard setting, but also but also led to ever increasing forms of, of compliance with the rules by states, right? So that was the moment of expansion of the norms cascade, the 1990s, and naturally we were, I, I wasn't part of that group, but uh, uh, so the scholarly community and also uh, practitioners were interested in, in, in understanding this hopeful moment of expansion of human rights as the kind of the global framework for uh, global justice and the common language that uh, states and activists could speak to make uh, each other's claims for justice commensurable. What happens and, uh, now is that we're seeing the swinging of the pendulum. So there's two ways that we're discussing this with uh, Patrick earlier today. One way to see this in, is in the long durée, like long-term changes in, in historical uh, um, uh, trends. So you know, that's why Polanyi, Karl Polanyi, is also coming back in both sociology, law, and everywhere else, because you could see this as a, a movement or counter-movement type of uh, dialectic, right? This is the, the word that uh, Patrick was trying to revive earlier today, right? That he said, so this is just as we had a moment of expansion, this, uh, we're, uh, now this is a moment of contraction. Uh, that, that I think is very perceptive from a theoretical and analytical point of view, but it's not very helpful for, for practitioners, right? So I, I, that's not, I love Polanyi, I, <laughs> I, I've used it in my dissertation, but I cannot go to the Justicia and tell them, that, look, let's just wait out these issues for 10 years, <laughs> things will get better, right? Uh, um, so at the more granular level, I think what needs to be done is to pay close attention to those moments of backlash. Right, and uh, and the, the, the examples and the illustrations that you gave are quite on point. One huge backlash in Latin America is uh, coming from um, the evangelical right, transnationally organized, highly sophisticated, um, reacting against the decades of expansion of women's and LGBTI rights. Right, so the, the, what what's um, worrying to me is that. Um, because human rights activists, we tend to have this kind of, uh, also we feel strongly about um, these issues. And also righteousness is in, you know, in, in abundant supply in the human rights movement for good reasons, but also it makes us blind to uh, counter movements. Uh, so, and we tend to discount the uh, way in which the targets of human rights activism also have uh, have capacity to learn over time. They wise up to the strategies of human rights organizations and react, and this is what's happening on each of the counts, environmental activism, gender, um, uh, the very idea of transnational advocacy networks. I, if I read correctly, because these days you don't know whether this is coming to, uh, from reliable sources, but I read also that the new minister of the, uh, uh, for foreign affairs of Brazil, the newly appointed one, uh, said something like globalism is something that needs to be dismantled, right? So the very idea to globalism is another way to say, well, transnational efforts at, in, among other things, at bringing people together to fight for uh, human rights and environmental issues and so on. So, and, and we know that Steve Bannon is creating his own international, right? So, uh, so there's learning process on both sides. And, and one thing that needs to be done urgently is to learn and do more systematic research and take seriously the counter movement. You know, who are they? When I give, I give one final example coming from the Justicia's work. Um, when we had worked very intensely in, uh, in support of the peace accord in Colombia between the government and the FARC, right? They spent years and years, my colleagues uh, working in the transnational, uh, transnational, uh, transnational justice line of, of, of research had spent a lot of time trying to come up with sophisticated ways to to make compatible the uh, Rome Statute demands with 
the needs of, of the political um, uh, uh, context in Colombia and the possibilities for a peace accord between FARC and the government. Long story short, by a slim margin, the peace accord was defeated right, in the polls. Next, time, next round back uh, discussion that we had was, on, uh, was with, a, with a sociologist of religion who, for the first time, explained to us who the voters from the evangelical uh, uh, churches that had come out strongly against the court war. We had no idea, and it's not just the justicia, it's the, you know, the human rights camp uh, writ large. So that learning process, sometimes it's painful, but it is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm gonna use my last 90 seconds here um, to uh, respond both to Patrick's last question about the problematization of democracy and also hopefully simultaneously uh, to respond to the, uh, the question from the back on why does Orban and his ilk why do they get such good traction, uh, uh, particularly now? And I'm going to respond to both of those questions by throwing in a curveball here, and that is by starting with the word capitalism. <laughs> I just happened to just finish reading a, a dissertation on Hungary, and it was called The Wounds of Post-Socialism. And it, of course, could have been called the wounds of the introduction of capitalism. And it was a very carefully done dissertation. It was about mortality rates. And it started out by saying the demographic catastrophe that occurred post-liberalization, i.e. post the introduction of capitalism in Hungary, and other parts of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union was the worst demographic catastrophe to have occurred in the last 50 years, perhaps outside of China. Okay, so where do we go from the wounds of the introduction of capitalism to Patrick's question? I would argue that one of the reasons everybody from Trump to Orban gets traction is because democratic regimes have proved incapable of responding to the destruction of people's quest for dignified livelihoods, which is the product of global capitalism at work. And I would argue further that transnational activist networks also have to confront the fact that as long as the operation of global capitalism destroys people's opportunity for dignified livelihoods, then people like everybody from, from, uh, from Orban uh, uh, to uh, perhaps now Bolsonaro, interesting, will be able to manipulate, to be able to manipulate political frames so as to say, democratically elected folks in the past haven't done it, I will do it because I don't follow the rules, I'm an authoritarian, therefore I can do it. Now, of course, the good news here is they can't. And the question is, what happens when people figure out that they can't, and will that create new opportunities? Okay, time for a drink. Thanks to everyone. It's been a